wanted to thank Ingrid for this portrait of Toki, Lolita. Um, and uh, Carly already pointed out that she has pretty good teeth. Uh, Ingrid uh, says she has one, maybe two damaged teeth, maybe three, uh, but most of them are really good. She is competent to clump down on a, bit, on a fish without a problem. Uh, so, first I want to get you up to date on the Lolita campaign, on what's going on. There's a lot of dynamic action going on. Um, <coughs> on uh, June 1st, our suit against the Sequarium for violations of the Endangered Species Act was dismissed without trial uh, on the grounds that the Animal Welfare Act supersedes the ESA for animals in captivity and that there is no violation of the ESA unless it can be shown that Lolita is not just harmed or harassed, as the law says, but she must be under grave threat to her survival. So we are appealing uh, the legal team, Toki's legal team, is appealing. Um, and I believe that she is indeed under grave threat to her survival, but that the ESA does not require that she be under grave threat to her survival to qualify as being harmed and harassed, uh, and that the ESA should supersede the weak AWA anyway. Uh, so the judge just seemed to want to throw it out without trial, and she did. Um, so we are appealing, but that could take another year before there's any kind of decision on the appeal. Uh, Toki's legal team is also suing the USDA again uh, on the Animal Welfare Act, on the lax enforcement, uh, because they issued a license to the new owner, Palace Entertainment, and you can't transfer a license, but they did anyway. So. Uh, we just launched a suit, the team, uh, I'm named in it too, uh, launched a suit uh, against the USDA again on the grounds of the violations of the Animal Welfare Act. Uh, since 2011, Toki's legal team has launched a long list of suits to apply whatever legal leverage is possible to mandate her return to her home and family. And we aren't giving up. This team is determined. But, given the delays in the court of law, we're back to where we've really always been, which is to argue the case for her in the court of public opinion. And in that court, thanks in large part to a big, powerful documentary film we're all very familiar with, and numerous books and blogs and articles about orca captivity and many beautiful songs and artwork from people of all ages, of all kinds, uh, and the educational value of the steady stream of legal actions, and thousands upon thousands of dedicated campaigners all over the world, we're winning. We are winning public opinion. There are signs everywhere you look. Orca captivity is going out of style. And dolphin and marine mammal and other large mammals in captivity is soon to follow. And Rachel Carberry's uh, video of the empty the tanks demonstrations around the world, that is so heartwarming and encouraging and just shows you again, it's everywhere. Um, we don't have attendance figures for the Sequarium, but the stock price of a once powerful company called SeaWorld is in the dumpster, despite massively expensive um, advertising. Prime time advertising, I'm sure you've seen it too, and greenwashing, and everything, every trick they can think of, uh, promising not to captive breed anymore. And yet, their stock is at an all time low down there. Uh, pretty near, anyway. They were at 13 something at one point, but uh, they just can't uh, bring it up to where it was before August of 2014 when the first returns after Blackfish came out and it dropped 30, 40, 50 percent, and it has stayed at that bottom ever since. So uh, they can't get their stock going again. Um, 
but protests are taking place all the time. There's a steady drumbeat every weekend at this aquarium, and a group called Shutdown Palace is holding demonstrations at many of the 40 or so water parks of various kinds operated in the US by Palace Entertainment. And in the UK, at the office of Arl Capital, which is the investment house that owns the corporation that owns Palace Entertainment, this amazing street theater demonstration was held April 1st, and many thanks to Margo and Liz of Marine Connection and graphic designer extraordinaire Joe Phillips for doing a, a street demonstration that was so eye-catching and entertaining and informative that it generated a story in the London Sunday Times about Lolita. <laughs> that held these investors, these bowler-hatted British investors, responsible for Lolita's captivity right there in the headline. So uh, we're making a lot of progress in a lot of areas. And the portfolio at Arl Capital that includes the Sequarium <laughs> and marine land in France and other dolphinariums around the world and a lot of water parks is steadily losing value. That's so far this year. Um, it may be because they're selling tickets to people to watch enslaved whales and dolphins do circus tricks. That's going out of style. Those days are rapidly ending and those companies will have to adapt. We just have to get the whales and dolphins in captivity out of those misery pits. And the next captive orca to return could be, could be Morgan, it could be Kiska, but it could be Toki. Uh, her retirement home is in an ideal location. It's just absolutely perfect. It needs only infrastructure and personnel. We have no time frame on when this might happen to begin installing or hiring, uh, nor do we have budget, but that would all happen anytime we get a green light. Uh, and we are collaborating with the designer and builder and engineer of Keiko Sea Pen to make sure that our plan is safe and sound. And we have a 40 some odd page plan and many appendices uh, on the web if you'd like to look at any of the details. So now I'm going to get all science y and, and <laughs> theoretical. Because uh, well, this how is. Deep Sorry? How deep is it? How deep? Oh, how deep is it? Yeah, it just hurts. Just oh, deep. okay. Well, it's right. about 50 feet, depending on the tide, yeah. average tide. Uh, yeah, I mean, right. yeah, it's huge. Okay. I mean, compared to 48 by oh, 80. Not even. Yeah. Um, so, science. Uh, this is sort of about science, about our scientific understanding. It's also about getting to know the orchids that live here, about getting to know them better, understanding them better. And as Rachel Carver pointed out, that's how activists get their information. That's how we know what we know. That's how policymakers change society. So the science is really important. So what I'd like to do now is explain why I am confident that Toki can readapt, can remember how to act, and will thrive in her home waters. In a word, sociology. Nobody saw that coming. Uh, <laughs> sociology is the scientific study of the development structure and functioning of human society. Sociology studies human cultural behavior and since about 1920 in the context of Darwinian evolutionary theory. Included in sociology is the study of taboos. That's how matriarchs rule. <laughs> <laughs> taboos are behavior or language that is forbidden. Taboos are learned from others, maybe encoded in laws, written or unwritten, or maybe unspoken. One taboo for sociologists themselves is to never apply any theories or concepts used in sociology to describe the behavior of any non-human animals. Early sociologists made it clear they believed only humans had the capacity for culture or for shared meanings or symbolic interactions of any kind, which is understandable because until the results of field studies 
began to come in on residents and transient orcas and other types worldwide in just the past three decades, there was almost no evidence of any non-humans capable of creating cultures anything like human cultures. But now there is. In 2001, Hal Whitehead and Luke Rendell wrote this in a paper called Culture in Whales and Dolphins. The complex and stable vocal and behavioral cultures of sympatric groups of killer whales, that's in the same habitat, appear to have no parallel outside humans and represent an independent evolution of cultural faculties. Wow. That was a breakthrough paper that equated orca cultures to human cultures. I thought that might get the attention of some sociologists, but as far as I know, no sociologist has written about orca societies. US, UCSD sociologist Susan Davis has written about SeaWorld's ability to define orcas for public consumption, but not about how the orcas define themselves. But they do define themselves. And that may be the key to understanding orca cultures and pretty much the full range of orca behavior. Self-definition and self-determination are sociological concepts, but sociologists won't talk about orcas being capable of those things because they aren't human. And most cetologists won't say much about self-definition and cultural identity in orcas because those are not biological concepts. It's generally taboo for cetologists to borrow ideas from sociology to talk about the social behavior or cultures of whales. But there are exceptions. Last month, a paper about sympatric sperm whale clans was published showing that cultural identity is important in this species in both the North Atlantic and the Pacific. The paper showed that sympatric vocal sperm whale cultures do exist, and that their genetic signatures track their cultural identities almost perfectly. Media reports on that paper clarified that the authors are saying sperm whales use language. So that's an example of cetologists drawing from at least pop sociology to talk about whale behavior. And orca researchers have established that cultural learning and behavior can lead to genetic differences. Once again, the media is more willing to state the obvious. Orca evolution is driven by their cultures. So this begs a looming scientific question. How to explain the cultural diversity and the sympatric speciation in orcas? This is one of the most pressing problems in cetology today, but cetologists don't consult sociology to help solve that problem, and sociologists won't step up to contribute any ideas from their field of study. So there's this gap. It's not a wall, because a wall would be visible, no matter who pays for it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you got that. Um, it's a chasm. It's a chasm that's invisible, a vast abyss between sociological knowledge about how human societies develop and function in the biological community who are trying to figure out how orca societies develop and function. Sociologists and biologists won't talk to each other. They're like residents and transients. <laughs> so we're going to leap across that chasm right here, right now, because it's impeding progress in both sociology and biology. It would be amazing for sociologists to study a mammal other than humans that has also evolved advanced cultural capabilities, living almost entirely according to learned meanings and traditions mediated by languages, a self-aware, self-defining species that over the eons has found its own solutions for how to live consciously on planet Earth, how to cooperate to find food and use habitat, and has created a wide array of complex and sometimes competing societies almost entirely without violence or aggression, either within or between communities. But I don't see any sociologists going there. And cetologists might turn to sociology to help solve their problems, especially the extreme cultural diversity and speciation found among orca populations. It's a problem cetologists are actively working on 
recent papers have proposed two theories. One paper proposes that historical dietary limitations resulted in long-term isolation between populations and then culture took over to keep them apart. Another paper suggests glacial cycles led to specialized behaviors in specific populations before culture took over to keep them apart. But neither theory really accounts for the wide variety of mutually exclusive orca cultures worldwide, often in the same habitats, for hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of years. Sociology might have some insights or theories to approach this vexing question. Sometimes our words hinder our understanding of what is happening in the natural world. Consider the word ecotype. We've all heard it. Ecotypes are categories of orca populations that are similar but different from other ecotypes in their prey selection, genetic makeup, and other parameters. It is a useful term to see the broad spectrum of orca cultures, but it's a very imprecise term. In 2011, Robert Pittman said, the term ecotype then merely recognizes scientific uncertainty with regard to killer whale diversity. And until we know more about killer whale speciation, the term ecotype will remain a placeholder for a work in progress. From a sociological perspective, there are two problems with ecotype. First, the word implies and assumes an ecological or an environmental origin for the various types of orcas, like glacial events or dietary limitations as original causes. But those explanations don't account for the multitude of completely distinct cultures of orcas found in all oceans. What's been keeping them apart all these millennia? Another problem with ecotype is that it lumps communities together that act alike in some ways, like northern and southern residents, into single ecotypes. But that doesn't account for the fact that they avoid each other like a plague, have completely different call repertoires, don't interbreed, and are on separate evolutionary tracks. The term ecotype obscures this essential distinction. And there's still no plausible theory to explain why there are residents and big whales or transients. For just one example who are totally different behaviorally in every possible way, and yet they cross paths every day and are highly aware of each other, and biologically they could interbreed, but culturally they can't, because it would be taboo. Orcas have taboos too, lots of them, like the apparently universal taboo against harming humans, which is a very good thing. <laughs> but remember, it's their choice every time. So how did that happen? And how does it continue happening? What are the behavioral mechanisms that keep each community absolutely cohesive and totally apart from all the others? I don't see any explanation for this extremely rare, if not unprecedented, propensity to form into highly diverse, mutually repellent communities made up of extended families, most having just a few hundred members. Of course, it was only 35 years ago or so that Mike Big and Ken and others documented that R's and T's were completely different populations of the same species in the same habitat. And I'm just gonna take this opportunity to say we wouldn't know much at all about these whales if it wasn't for Ken's perseverance and skill and smarts over the last few years. It remains unheard of anywhere else in the, in the wildlife biology, except to some extent among other cetaceans. But there's still no good explanation for how these different diverse populations can exist, coexist in the same habitats. So to give you a sense of where I'm coming from, my BA degree is in, guess what, sociology, <laughs> from UC Berkeley and Colorado College. For the past three and a half decades or so that I've been learning and writing and speaking about orcas, I've been quietly applying sociological perspectives to try to understand orcas. And it's helped me to see orca cultures since the early 80s. So at long last, 
I'd like to suggest some kind of collaboration or synthesis of sociology and cetology. I'd rather it came from a department chair at a major university to get some traction, <laughs> but I've waited long enough. <laughs> My hope for the future is to see sociologists and cetologists do lunch or do a workshop or a conference. It might give sociologists a new perspective on human cultures by comparing and contrasting with orca cultures. And it might provide some new ways to explain orca cultures. I'm not saying sociology could tell us exactly how orcas develop their communities, but they might start by seeing it as a given that orcas millions of years ago evolved the cognitive, the empathic, and the intellectual capacity to create their own social networks and traditions and form themselves into cohesive societies. Sociologists might look for trust-building rituals and behaviors that reinforce social bonds like greeting ceremonies or food sharing or any of the tactile, touchy-feely social behaviors we see so often out there, although not as often as we used to. Sociologists might look for precursors, believed to be necessary for humans to build cultures, especially the ability to communicate using symbols. They would probably investigate how orcas use language to share their traditions and cultural identities. Cetologists, however, generally seem to prefer not to discuss language or symbolism. In Culture in Whales and Dolphins, 15 years ago, the author said, human culture is intimately linked to both language and symbolism, but there is currently no empirical basis for discussing the role or non-role of language and symbolism in cetacean culture. They established that they live in cultures. That was breakthrough, but they didn't really want to go any further and talk about how they do that. But to exist at all, cultural identities and a sense of self must be shared socially and remembered at all times. Belonging to a culture requires a high level of self-awareness and a theory of mind continually assessing what's going on in the minds of others and an assumption of personhood, of self and others the capacity for agency or self-determination, and knowledge of your reference group, who you belong to, all held within the minds of each member and referred to with symbols. That's all straight out of sociology, but there's no reason to assume it doesn't also apply to orcas. The evidence is their cultures. You can't have complex, cohesive, long-lasting cultures without symbolic interaction. All of it has to be shared and continually reinforced or modified by a process called symbolic interaction, which is a robust subdiscipline within sociology. I actually took a class from that guy in 1966. <laughs> He's as mean as he looks. <laughs> What Bloomer says here is meant to apply only to humans, of course. But why would orcas not also act according to meanings learned from others? For instance, a Chinook salmon must mean one thing to a resident and something entirely different to a transient when they come across them, the same fish. Uh, those are meanings that they learn culturally. Bloomer notes that behaviorism doesn't allow for interpretation between stimulus and response. Symbolic interactionism assumes that personal interpretation is constant and inevitable and essential to human social behavior. And I would add to orca behavior. They're always interpreting their world around them in those big brains. Bloomer lists three primary criteria required for humans to be able to be capable of symbolic interaction. First is to have very large brains. I think Lori uh, established that they have very big brains, and according to a recent paper, they orcas may have the biggest brains on the planet. Uh, two is the animal must rely heavily on society. Orcas' lives are inextricably intertwined with their societies. 
and we also rely on our societies. In order to function in society, we not only have to use language, but our very thoughts are formed using our language learned from others. So our behavior is inevitably coordinated with those with whom we interact, which seems to also be true for orcas. And to build cultures, an animal must be able to make a wide range of complex sounds. You've all heard orca chatter. To use as symbols. Check, check, and check. Humans and orcas fulfill all three criteria. Other animals may have very large brains, but may not rely on society to the extent that humans and orcas do. Or they may not be able to make a wide range of complex sounds. Sperm whales, for instance, seem to be limited to using a kind of Morse code to communicate their cultural identities. So a sociologist might assume that orcas evolved self-consciousness as humans did. And at some point, possibly 10 million years ago, saw the benefit of forming into cohesive, mutually bonded, deeply trusting communities, and that they have the neurologic, empathic, and linguistic ability to do that. So they did. Or sinus orca may have developed and refined their cultures to a very high level. I don't want to put an ordering of who's highest, but uh, providing stable, low stress, safe and satisfying social lives for all members in small interrelated communities where everybody knows your name that ensure plentiful nutrition as well as physical, mental, and emotional health for all. Maybe we could learn a thing or two from them. And that's why I believe Toki will know what to do if and when she's allowed to come home. To this day, she still calls out in the calls she learned before capture 46 years ago. She's still trying to communicate with her family after 46 years in captivity. She defined herself as a member of her family long before she was captured. And I believe she still knows who she is and how to act. Okay, well now I've broken taboos in both sociology and psychology. And if I've offended anyone, I'm truly sorry. But you know what they say, if you see something, say something. So <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Thank you. Question. 
How is it that I don't know if it's called a pod will eat the Chinook salmon and the other pod doesn't primarily? Right. Why is that? Well, they act completely differently. The residents eat them, the transients move right along. They don't bother them at all. And the same is true conversely if it's a seal or a porpoise. Well, not entirely. Sometimes residents play with the porpoise. But I, I, I didn't really get the drift of your question. Yeah, I'm just asking why, why do they do that? Why do, why well, that's the culture. That's what they learn when they're very okay. young by all kinds of messages. We obviously don't know the full range of how they transmit their culture to their young, uh, but they, uh, they basically grow up learning what to eat and what not to eat. And uh, it's very strict and rigid, and it is a, a symbol of membership, and membership is everything. So they do, not, they do not contradict the symbols. Please use the microphone. Oh. <laughs> um, sorry. Yeah, uh, the question was why do they see a fish differently if they're a resident or a transient? And it's how they were raised. It was, it's, it's what they learn from their elders as they grow up. Uh, and it's very strict and rigid, and uh, you, you act appropriately at all times basically you know within the range of what is permissible they seem to be having fun out there a lot so it's not like it's dismal uh, but it is very uh, strict and channeled and rigid as far as what they can do um, in terms of mating in terms of uh, eating foraging uh, association patterns uh, you know, who to hang out with, uh, when to come and go, who you listen to, we don't have any idea, really. Their range of behaviors and responses to each other out there, but uh, it's all what they learn growing up, and, and they stick with it because they stay as members. Yes? Yeah, Howard, do you think that, you know, the kinks and the Chinooks get lower and lower, and they, you know, they're having to like, work really hard to catch one Chinook and they got a school of silvers that go by there, they're not gonna go, well, those are yeah. silver those kids, don't, don't eat those silver. Right. Are they, are they gonna, is it well, gonna be that, that's, that that's a huge question. There have been yeah. workshops about that. The question is uh, if the Chinook gets smaller and scarcer but a bunch of sockeye go by, are they gonna change their menu uh, so they'll have something to eat at least? And, uh, you know, I can't rule that out. Uh, there's, uh, I, I would say, and I'm really in over my head, Ken should answer this one, but uh, there's sort of uh, competing lines of evidence. One is between 1995 and 2001 when the Chinook were drastically depleted, the mortalities went way up. They didn't switch. I don't know, there weren't a lot of other species of salmon around either, but there were halibut, there were other, you know, other possibilities for them to eat they didn't, they died instead. Uh, but the other thing is, we really have a picture of their prey preferences only from the last 10 years or so. I mean, there's, there's some you know, anecdotal and, and other evidence from before that, but really a dedicated effort came out of the listing at, under the ESA in 2005 to find out what are they eating. So that's what we know is from that now 10 year period. And uh, it's mainly Chinook, about 80% Chinook, and some coho in the summer, and some chum in the fall down in Puget Sound, Admiralty Inlet in Puget Sound. Mm -hmm. So that's a snapshot, 10 years. We don't know if 40, 50, 100 years ago, they were 100% Chinook, and they've added some side dishes because of the scarcity of Chinook. Mm -hmm. That's only a theory. I'm not saying that's the case. I'm just wondering if that may be. Yeah. Um, so, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Howard. Michael Mott here. Michael. <clears throat> In the legal case, uh, as opposed to Animal Welfare or Endangered Species Act criteria for the appeal, is there any legal teeth to having criteria be on sociological grounds? Mm -hmm. Is there any precedent for that anywhere else? Oh boy! And, and if it's sociological, <laughs> if it's sociolo sociological, 
is it not necessarily a violation of biological animal welfare laws, or is it now a violation of ethical or cruelty laws when it comes to captivity right. from a legal perspective? Well, I think it would have to be established in the scientific literature first. So you saw it get started right here. <laughs> um, you know, I'd love to publish in a journal. Uh, anyway, other questions? Hi, Howard. Um, as a small child, I visited Miami's Aquarium from Miami. Back then, there was Seaquarium, the Monkey Jungle, uh, Parrot Jungle, all these little crazy places. Um, all of those are gone, basically. Is there any pressure from the city of Miami to actually get rid of this <laughs> place? Because it's kind of embarrassing. It's in the city of Miami. Well, it is embarrassing, and uh, the mayor of Miami Beach, Philip Levine, has been very vocal about how this is a disgrace to our city. We can do better than that. It's a throwback to an old age. He's fantastic, but that's Miami Beach. Uh, it is a revenue generator for Miami-Dade County. It's on county property. They pay a lease. They hire 100 people. Um, I'm sure they're in a quandary about what to do, uh, but you know somebody's got to make the first move. Who has the power to do that? And we haven't seen that yet. Is that it? Ah, one up there. Two-part question, one is that they're fed, uh, you know, whatever in captivity and they eat it, so, uh, but that's always traumatic in the beginning, um, if it's not, well it's not, their traditional food or way of getting it, so uh, there's, as I understand, you know, after captures there was always a week or two or three or a month when they wouldn't eat and finally they get, you know, so hungry, they will eat chopped up halibut, uh, smelt, whatever they're being tossed. Uh, so they can adapt, and there's a famous story in Eric Hoyt's book about the transients, before anyone knew there were transients that ate only marine mammals, that were captured and were attempted to be fed fish, and they wouldn't eat fish for something over 60 days. Uh, there were three of them, and one of them died of starvation. So the other two, a male and female, uh, after a, a loud chatter, uh, of some kind <laughs> came over and grabbed a fish, the male, and took it to the female and gave it to her. Or at first, as I recall in the book, they swam the perimeter of the pen they were in, each holding one end of the fish. Then I think she ate it. Maybe they tore it apart and shared it. I'm not sure of the details, but they had to go through that sort of ritual of mutual acceptance of violating that taboo to eat, and they did. Uh, then they got out of there and went right back to marine mammals. Um, so that can happen. As far as Shemek, I really am not up to date. This, you know, He's languishing in that tiny pool in Argentina, and I don't have any more updates. I don't know of any real uh, you know, program plan to find a way to uh, you know, remove him into a sea pen or back to the ocean in any way. I wish I could give you better news on him and others. I think we're set. Thank you. Thanks, Howard. Really appreciate it. Um, just, just quickly, looking at the time, there was, there was a possibility that we might be showing voiceless again tonight, but given that the line kiln event is starting at five, we're, we're not gonna do that. And our last presentation is going to be